Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. Today's another AMA episode. That is, ask me anything. I love to answer your questions. If you have a question you think is going to be of broad interest, send it in. I'll answer it live on the air. Send your questions to victor at victorjm.com. That's victor at victorjm.com. Ray from Florida asks, I'm talking to an owner that will owner finance 100% of a small 20-unit mobile home park that also has three commercial buildings, and one of the buildings is leased. The problem is 16 mobile home sites are occupied and the homes are park-owned. From everything I've read, it seems wise to see if I can get the tenants to own these homes through a rent-to-own program or gifting. The seller's business would be very different than mine, and therefore the value would be very different as well. The park has been on the market for over a year. How would I go about valuing the property while also understanding if he's going to finance the whole thing for me? Thanks for your help. Well, Ray, this is a great question. The problem that I see with the park is that it's too small. Even if you get the park to 100% occupancy, you're only looking at income from the ground rent in the mobile home park of about four to 6000 a month. That doesn't even pay for the staff to operate the park, let alone to pay the taxes, maintenance, and so on. And even if you got the park for free, I'm not sure it's worth the effort. If the seller is going to sell or finance 100% of the park, then you sort of are getting it for free. If they're offering seller financing right from the very beginning, it means that others have tried to buy it already and passed on the opportunity. Now, if you aspire to become an investor, as opposed to simply buying yourself a job, then you need to look at the assets that generate enough income to hire staff. You only have four vacancies in the park, and therefore your upside is pretty limited. You can only collect an additional $800 to $1,200 a month in ground rent, depending on how much you charge per home site. The park currently has 16 park-owned homes, and who knows how that value is being carried on the books. Now, if you're serious about getting into the mobile home park business, I suggest you build relationships with people who are experienced mobile home park operators who can help mentor you on what it takes to make a successful park. The fact is, you can have a vision for the community that you ultimately want to build. Some parks are the housing of last resort for the economically weakest members of our society, and these are sometimes the worst slums in an area. The other end of the spectrum, there are amazingly beautiful parks that are well-kept, Some are retirement communities with great amenities, and some of them have some of the newest high-quality modular homes built by the nation's best modular home builders. You get to decide what kind of product you want to deliver to the market, and you get to assess whether there's demand for that product in a given area. And all too often, I see newer investors going after smaller assets simply because they don't have the cash to buy something larger. The skill that's missing is the skill of raising capital. The conventional way of thinking is to only use the money you currently have available at your fingertips. I personally believe the ideal mobile home park should have at least 150 spaces, and if it's distressed, it should be at about 50 to 60% occupancy, operating at somewhere close to break even. From there, you can take the park to full occupancy and add significant value with minimal downside risk. Those larger parks might cost a bit more to purchase and you're probably going to need more cash than you have available. A larger park brings enough income to justify the staff. And if you want to be a real estate investor, then you need a project that can fund employees. Otherwise, you're just buying a job. For example, I own a 200-unit park that we built from scratch. It employs three people essentially full-time in addition to bringing in investment returns. If you have the skill of raising capital, then the purchase price ceases to be an obstacle. And if you have a team of specialists where one of you was an expert at, say, operations, another was an expert at raising funds, and perhaps a third was an expert at construction management, you could grow and scale your business without limits. If you knew how to put together the business plan for a larger facility and you knew how to talk to investors, then you wouldn't need to have to have the money. You'd only need to know how to get the money. Now, there's nothing wrong with providing housing to people who have less money. In fact, it's a great thing to do. And housing, like any product, gets sold to people who have money. And when a tenant rents a property from you, they're making the decision to purchase from you repeatedly each and every month. If that same customer went to the grocery store every week 
And instead of paying their food when they went to the cashier, they told the store manager that they'll get paid in two weeks and then they'll have more money. The store manager would send them on their way. And somehow, in the world of real estate, there's a sense of entitlement where some tenants think that they don't need to pay for the products they purchase. Don't be scared of a larger product. Don't be scared of buying a higher quality asset. And I can tell you the path to financial freedom is found in those larger products, but only when combined with the skill of operations and the skill of raising capital. I want to thank you, Ray, for an awesome question. Go after the bigger projects. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.